All right. Good, good morning, everybody. Welcome here at University of Johannesburg School of Tourism and Hospitality. Great seeing all the faces again. Um, also, welcome to all the people on YouTube and Zoom. Uh, we're going to have a, quite a nice collaborative session. It's a very focused uh, topic we have today, a specialized uh, topic. And uh, we're talking about advanced technology in freight movement. Um, all right, for the record, it's the 2nd of March, 2023. And um, we're going to have exciting presenters today uh, across the world. It's in a, in a real sense of the word, a hybrid event. So we've got hybrid attendees and we've got hybrid presenters and in-person uh, attendees and so on. So it's very exciting. And as you can see in the front, technology-wise, it's quite a challenge. But we're doing it. So, um, ladies and gents, the topics we're going to have a look at today is going to address lots of the, the major problems we have in South Africa in terms of infrastructure and the process of transport. So, um, uh, after Dr. George Margheta, our host, going to do the welcome, then we're going to have Mr. Yaku Luru, Chief Operating Officer of SeaTrack, and he's going to talk about adaptive technologies to support an ever-changing uh, ever transport landscape. Um, then we're going to have a presentation from Italy. Uh, now, I hope I pronounced these names correctly. It's Matteo Genovese and Andrea Gatti. And they're going to talk about the railway maintenance evolution from screwdriver to artificial intelligence. So we're looking forward to that as well. And then Mr. Franz Trubi, he's the Chief Executive Officer of the Eastway Labs. Um, and uh, I think that's a topic that we're all very concerned about nowadays in South Africa is what's happening to our rail tracks and our rail infrastructure. And their company has got an innovative solution. So they're just going to talk about the revolutionizing rail vandal proof technology, much needed for South Africa. So where are they tampering on the rail tracks and so on, and they can help us with solutions. Um, all right, then the, the second half, uh, we were going to have Louise Widgets. He's going to present from KZN. She, she uh, was supposed to be here, but the, a customer called her in. So she has to be at KZN. And uh, she's going to talk about new trends on digitalization of the supply chain. And then Dr. Karine Fenter from the CSIR. Uh, she's busy with a project in the Eastern Cape. She couldn't be here herself, but very innovative technology in support of safer road infrastructure and actually satellite technology and very interesting stuff they use to um, enhance the road, the road infrastructure. So uh, we've got technology for road infrastructure and technology for rail infrastructure as well here. And then the Italian the Italians is going to tell us more about you know, predictive maintenance, how do you maintain your rolling stock and so on. So very exciting. Ladies and gents, um, obviously all these events are for free. Um, and uh, apologies for the guys online, you can't see the presenter very clear because we've got a bit of a challenge with lightning in the venue here, um, but we will do as good as we can. Um, everything is for free. So we have got valued alliances and sponsors making this possible. And let's give quickly recognition to them. So there are formal organizations or organizations that's formally in relation with the Transport Forum. And we're quickly going to have a look at each one of them. Uh, there are obviously many other organizations also involved, but these are in a formal agreement with us. So we've got the South African Association of Freight Forwarders, so already established in 1921, and they make a major contribution to facilitating trade with South Africa, and their member com companies manage over 80% of South Africa's international trade. So that is great stuff. Thank you, Sof. We've got the South African Express Parcel Association, they represent the, the representative body of the express delivery in the industry in South Africa. We've got the Road Freight Association. On Tuesday, we had an uh, event with them in Boxburg. And uh, you can see they say, without trucks, South Africa stops, representing the truckers. We've got the African Rail Industry Association representing the railways industry. And they're doing great work also on third party access. Um, and uh, getting private sector and government to collaborate closer. So it's great work Marcelo and Tlapo and team are doing. 
and then the South African Bus Operators Association, they represent the bus and coach industry. And uh, three weeks ago, we had a big event and a planning session with them as well. And all of them do lots of uh, sessions through the Transport Forum. So uh, those are our formal agreements with associations. We also have formal agreements with media houses, such as Freight News, Railways African Engineering News. Obviously, there are many other journalists and media houses joining the Toronto Forum, which we appreciate for all your support. I uh, actually can mention it, ladies and gents, today, well, this month is the Toronto Forum's birthday. We're now 16 years old. So we've been running for 16 years. And also thanks to you know, all these media companies and sponsors making it possible in the media, the journalists giving us exposure, and we're very thankful to them making it possible. So Freight News actually been involved since the inception of the Transport Forum, also been known as Freight News Trading Weekly. It's all about logistics and news. Um, I would like to mention that anybody is welcome to interrupt us or interrupt me while I'm speaking, should you uh, wish to say a few words about these organizations. All right, we've got Railways Africa magazine, Continent Specialist Trade, Technical Business to Business Online Publication, over covering all aspects of the rail sector. So, yeah, thank you very much, Railways Africa. And then we've got Engineering News, part of the Crema Media Group. Um, ladies and gents, they um, usually give us a video, uh, a summary of a week's um, news and... Um, we still got last week's news. It's still the early, obviously, for this week's news. So let's see what they have to share. Hello, and welcome to this week's edition of the Engineering News and Mining Weekly magazine, published on Friday, 24 February, 2023. In this week's cover article, Engineering News and Mining Weekly Senior Deputy Editor Natasha Oudendahl writes that telecommunications companies are feeling the pressure of sustained levels of load shedding. As South Africa's persistent load shedding shows no signs of abating, the country's telecommunications companies are having to ramp up mitigation measures in an effort to keep consumers connected. The engineering news features focus on industrial and commercial lighting, where solar fittings illuminate load shedding shadows, and rubber products and recycling, where a partnership aims to benefit the rubber recycling industry. The Mining Weekly features focus on South Africa's mining outlook, where the foundation is being laid for a renewed interest in exploration. And mining in Namibia, where uranium demand is growing on the back of the Paris Agreement. This week's business leader is Pule Mutibe, the incoming CEO of Ensika Consulting. And as this week's cartoon shows, it's far from clear what good will come from the decision to declare South Africa's long-running electricity crisis a state of disaster. We hope you enjoyed this week's edition of Crema Media's Engineering News and Mining Weekly. Be sure to subscribe to the magazine that offers you in-depth news about developments in the real economy by emailing subscriptions at engineeringnews.co.za. Happy reading and see you next time. Great stuff. Thank you very much, Engineering News. Um, ladies and gents, I've just been informed there that there's a big problem. Um, the entire Auckland Park's water is off. There's no water, right? In other words, the, the bathrooms are not functional. So, unfortunately, should you need to go to the bathroom, then you'll have to live somewhere outside of Auckland Park. That's the best we can offer you now on this stage. So, I sincerely apologize. Uh, we just can't do nothing. Hopefully, they get the water, you know, water pumps to work soon as again. But on this stage, that's the problem we sit with. So, I'm sincerely sorry about that. Ladies and gents, um, right, on uh, our host for today is University of Johannesburg. They've got the Institute for Transport and Logistics Studies. It's also part of the Department of Transport and, and Supply Chain Management. Um, the University of Johannesburg actually been involved with the Transport Forum since the inception of the Transport Forum. Prof. Jackie Walters and later Prof. Nalin Pisa. They've been driving us and the mentoring uh, myself quite a lot. And we do a lot of planning, you know, to to make these forums work. So we're very grateful for them. And, and uh, Dr. George Maghetto is just now going to do the welcome and I'll tell you more about UJ. 
So very thankful for them. Also, there's been a questionnaire handed out to you that you kindly need to uh, fill in as for a research project. I really appreciate if you can fill it in. Those of you who haven't noticed yet your the armrest of your seat, you, you can fold it up and it becomes a little table. If you, if you stretch down, you fold, bring up your armrest, you'll see it's a little table uh, on one of the sides. I don't want to, yeah. So if you go right down, <laughs> right down to the to the bottom and you grab and you bring it up, there you go. All right, then it's a little table. Great, they're discovering it now. Innovation. <laughs> right, ladies and gents, also the platinum sponsor of the Transport Forum is C Track. Uh, also, I've been part of the Transport Forum since inception. Uh, Krista, I don't know if you want to come and say a few words about C Track quickly. Morning, everyone. I'm Krista Klaasens from c -Track. I'm an account manager, and we look after alliances and partners. Um, so we offer transport and telematic solutions to our partners and our customers. I have a short video to show you of our recently launched um, Crystal platform. It's a single sign-on platform. So as you know, you normally sign on, you've got 10, 20 um, Logging to remember, so at least now we've made it easier. There will be one login. It will um, do it in a phased-in process um, from the easier to the most um, uh, more complex uh, clients. So, um, Harry, I've got a video. If you can play it for us, please. Thank you. Thank you, Krista. Um... Oh, Chris, there we go. Maximizing fleet uptime, whether big or small, is a daunting and time consuming task. Introducing Crystal, the all new, innovative, and all encompassing data platform from CTRAN, saves you time and money, helping you to streamline your vehicle fleet and asset control. CTRAN Crystal, configurable by you to your needs, means no more time consuming and unnecessary dashboards and reports. Only clear and precise data in real time, in the cloud, and accessible from anywhere in the world on any device. Simplify your driver management, task deployment, and communication through proactive driver behavior monitoring to ensure safe driving, less collisions, and in turn reduced insurance costs and third-party claims. With the Crystal app, the power is in your hands. C-Track Crystal, your tool for a more productive fleet, more proactive decision making and ultimately a better return on your fleet and asset investment. So whether you're on the beach in Bali, the sand dunes of the Sahara, or sunny South Africa, your fleet will always be safe, productive, and always visible. Great, thank you, C-Track. Ladies and gents, we also got Standard Bank, Standard Bank been involved many years, uh, past three years actually also as a gold sponsor. You can see they've got lots of experience and they believe that dreams matter and that together we can make them a reality. Kathy Bell from Standard Bank, transport specialist, also uh, managing the account with the Transport Forum and she's doing great work also with the road transport management system. So we really appreciate Standard Bank's support. Then we've got JC Auditors. I don't know if all of us online, if you want to say a few words. Seems to be all of us online today. JC Auditors, all about certification, compliance, one solution. Um, you can see the um, SANAS accredited certification body providing internationally recognized certifications. Um, thank you very much, JC Auditors, for your gold sponsorship. <laughs> Global Trade Solution, Louise Widget is presenting later on today from Global Trade Solution. You can see they've got innovative solutions from transforming the global supply chain, high-tech solutions, blockchain, all these, all these important technology we need today for secure transactions. And um, I'm sure you're going to join Louise's presentation later on today. Pegasus uh, Consulting, 
company of note. They say they change life, changing worlds. You can see they're involved in cities, climate, energy, resilience, transport, waste, and water. And they say they leverage their sector leading expertise and experience to craft and implement mobility solutions which work and have substantial impact. Thank you, Pegasus, for your gold sponsorship. Unitrans supply chain solution, innovation expertise delivered. All right, you can see they're a leading provider in integrated transportation, warehousing and supply chain based services to customers with a variety of needs, offering bespoke value propositions in each segment. Thank you, Unitrans. Also, Better Cargo. Better Cargo is delivering great important solutions to the express industry. And we know that the express industry nowadays is becoming more and more relevant. So they say they fulfill the needs of the express cargo industry for daytime and overnight cargo capacity across comprehensive Southern and East Africa footprint. Thank you, but uh, Cargo, for your gold sponsorship. The Ticket Pro Group, they've got two sponsorships with the Transport Forum, actually. Um, this one is the online booking tool for all your corporate online booking needs. Very convenient. They say they... No contracts, no hidden fees, just good business with straightforward, fair pricing. So, yeah, traveler protector, business guardian, cutting edge innovation. It's an online corporate traveling booking tool with everything you need and nothing you don't want. Very convenient. And uh, obviously, all the links you can get on the Transfer Forms website to these organizations. So, Ticket Pros also got the, the, the Smart Tap solution. So the solution includes key features like comprehensive route management, flexible passion and payment methods, flexible route and fair product setup, shift and dispatch management, cashier system inspection tools, and comprehensive MIS reports. Thank you, Ticket Pro, for your sponsorship. Zutari, Zutari is a consulting engineers of note, many years part of the Transport Forum Gold sponsorship, previously known as Oracon. You can see they say impact engineered. Thank you, Zutari. And we've got Kuba in the ticketing world, transforming ticketing, part of the ICA Mobility Group, which enables public and private transport to move into the digital area. You can see they do journey planning, smart ticketing, streamlining electronic payment, shaping the digital transformation of the mobility sector. They're also planning to host two of our events this year, later on this year. So we're looking forward to Nasipu and her team for hosting us. Easy clear, um, software solutions for custom clearing, freight forwarding and logistics providers, covering air, sea, road and rail. Thank you, Easy Clear, for your gold sponsorship. All right, those are our sponsors. Just important to note, ladies and gents, that at the end of the event today, we'll have lucky draws and you might be the winner of... Uh, a very nice like LED light. Um, and uh, so it's also a carrot for you to stay to the end, besides the, the nice lunch and the good presentations, but we will have a lucky draw in. So let's give all these alliance and sponsors a big hand for their sponsorship. Olga, you're just in time. <laughs> you can come to the front, thank you. <laughs> Ladies and gents, I want to introduce you to Olga Mashilu from Boleng Bontle Consultant. Uh, the Transport Forum has got a very popular business directory. We outsource the business directory to Olga. So Olga, tell them more. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Harry, for the opportunity. Um, as I said, I'm Olga Mashilu from Boleng Bontle Consultant, who have been uh, uh, appointed to they run the business directory, the Transport Forum business directory, where uh, all the uh, sectors, all the businesses uh, are registering or listing their businesses on our directory for 450 per annum. Um, with the business directory, you are able to have uh, partners or even uh, business uh, uh, leads through uh, our uh, business directory. So if you are looking for further information, I'm available. We have just set up table outside. You can come and uh, get more information. We have uh, per month at least it's around 7,000 tips or views on our business directory. Thank you. Thanks, Ari.
Thank you so much, Olga. Um, it's one of our B initiatives and she's doing a great work taking care of our business directory. Ladies and gents, uh, I'm going to keep the lights on for a while. Jan can have the number three again. <laughs> Thank you. So the, the Transport Forum's uh, website, most of you are familiar with that website, um, very popular. Um, that website you will use to download presentations that it uh, presented at the Transport Forum. You can actually download presentations presented over the past 16 years, more than 900 presentations. Um, you need to, to log in to the Transport Forum's website's account sector. Um, so when you go to that website, you'll see to the left of the screen, there's a user login section where you log in. Should you not have an account yet, then you click on sign up. And uh, once you've selected sign up, then um, you can create your own username and password. And by doing that, you can log in in future and for free download presentations. Everything is complimentary. All right. And as I said, there are more than 900 presentations you can download. So it's a very powerful knowledge base. Um, so once you've logged in, you can see you can go to, on the Transforms web page, you can go to events and you can select downloads and it will open up a little search engine looking more or less like that. It's very simple. It's got two, two fields, very simple to use. You've got the top field is you can type in any um, title or surname uh, like a title example, um, tracking, for example, and you hit search and it will give you all the presentations with the word tracking in the title uh, of all the presentations presented over the 16 years. Or you can go to the bottom field category and uh, you can select the day's date and hit search and it'll bring up that day's presentations. I know there's been a hacker recently on the site and he posted a lot of his watches and Swiss watches and I don't know whatever. So my my support people are busy removing all that nonsense. So I apologize that you see all that stuff on there. Um, we also always have to deal with the hackers. That, that's always a challenge. But all right, so back to the positive stuff. Ladies and gents, I would like to introduce you now um, to our host. Oh, let me say to you, um, yeah, well, I can't tell you, where, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't tell you where the bathrooms are, but because there's no water, uh, but it would have been across the, the passage here and you would find the bathrooms. Um, I believe they'll get the water up soon. All right, so Dr. Josh Maghetto, um, he's a keen supporter of Transport Forum for many years. Thank you very much, Josh, we appreciate it. And uh, he's a... The Jackson Supply Chain Management Researcher is also a senior lecturer at the University of Johannesburg, and he's going to do the formal welcome for us. Thank you very much, Josh. Thank you, Jan. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen of uh, the Transport Forum, uh, it's my pleasure this morning to welcome you to the University of Johannesburg, specifically to the Department of Transport and Supply Chain Management, and also to the Transport Forum. So it's a great, it's a great opportunity that we have this morning that uh, we have all industry players and the practitioners uh, joining us to have uh, a proper discussion, especially on the issues of freight management. We always thank uh, Harry for the magic that he does each and every time that we organize these events. He always makes them very lively and uh, making sure that we have all the relevant people attending so that we have proper engagements. Now at the Department of uh, Transport and Supply Chain Management, we have quite a number of uh, programs, starting right from a bridging program into the continuing education, uh, diplomas in logistics, transportation, and uh, road transport management. We also have a, a online uh, CEP program in uh, logistics. 
We have uh, full-time diploma programs, which are offered on this ABB campus. There's a diploma in logistics management and also a diploma in transport management. We also have advanced diploma program uh, that is in uh, logistics and also in transportation that is offered full-time, but the classes are held in the evening. So anyone is allowed to attend. Even when you are working, you can still make it. Uh, now to extend that, we also have an advanced diploma online program, which you can join online and, uh, and study at your own pace. Yeah. So then from there, you can progress to the honors program that is on uh, become honors in transport and the logistics management. So that's also a very exciting program that hushes you in into the postgraduate uh, uh, qualifications in uh, uh, masters in logistics or transport, that is masters in uh, logistics management or masters in transport economics. Uh, then from there, if you still have the nerves to continue with the academic, you can move on to the uh, doctorate <laughs> that is a, a PhD in uh, transport economics and a PhD in logistics management. So that is the offering uh, from our department of transport and supply chain management. So it's a wide offering and we try as much as possible to cater for everyone in, uh, in this particular sector. So uh, uh, officially feel very welcome to this particular uh, engagement uh, and uh, be free to discuss and come up with solutions that can help this particular industry. So, but what do we, what do we know about the freight sector uh, in, uh, in the country? We know very well that uh, road transport, moving freight by road is dominant in, uh, in our country. So whether you're thinking of moving freight within the country or across the borders, what comes into mind first is trucks. How are we going to move freight uh, uh, using, using trucks? But then the challenges abound. Many challenges come uh, with, with this. Uh, we are always thinking about transnet freight rail. How can it uh, uh, exploit its huge potential so that maybe it can play a major role in the movement of freight, especially in corridors where it has presence. Maybe, maybe technology can, can help, we, we, but we think technology is going to help. We also have maritime. Uh, of course, that is moving freight across, across the borders through water. Uh, we have air cargo that is picking up uh, after the serious COVID disruption. It's now picking up. But one thing that we notice across the country is that there is lack of model integration. You cannot move freight freely or seamlessly from sea to rail to road so that you have it within your, uh, at your organization, at your doorstep as, as quickly as you can imagine. Each of these modes act independently. They don't interact with each other. And that is a big, big uh, weakness that we have in the country. And our belief is that uh, technology can help. Now, we get that there are so many challenges in this sector. One of them is infrastructural challenges uh, because you see the congestion that we have in many of the corridors where we have freight movement, uh, especially tracking. We have safety and security issues. Uh, I mean, uh, if you are in South Africa and you're moving your goods by road, one of the major things that comes into mind is security. How would you secure your, your, your goods from point A to point B. And that also increases the cost of doing business because then you have to buy uh, uh, a very comprehensive insurance on, 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 uh, of the freight that you're moving. Uh, also with the climate change, uh, we have concerns, environmental concerns, especially regarding greenhouse uh, uh, gas emissions. So we're thinking of will electric trucks maybe eliminate this particular environmental challenge. So it's still a, a, a question that we, we need to answer. We also think of maybe more efficient engines can, can solve this, but 
is something that is still we need to we need to discuss. Now, the freight movement sector is a is an easy go for government. So you always get regulations changing each and every time. So uh, and the compliance issues are always are always a big challenge in this particular sector. So we continue asking the question: Will technology help in uh, in this so that we don't have so much red tape? And, uh, and uh, bottlenecks because of maybe compliance. We also have skills shortage in, uh, in this particular sector. We don't have the best of the skills in this sector. You think of from warehousing to packaging to even uh, driving some of the trucks is a, is a big issue in this particular sector. And uh, the, what I mentioned from uh, my previous discussion about integration, can technology help in integrating the various modes and also even uh, intramodal uh, integration so that there can be seamless movement of freight across the country. Now, there are quite a number of technologies that we can leverage on. Uh, some of them is the autonomous trucks, whereby now you can solve the skills issues, especially if we can manage to have trucks that are, require little uh, uh, human intervention and they can be moving uh, freight maybe can talk of even within the urban centers so that they can be moving. They have their own lanes maybe, and they can move tra uh, uh, freight uh, seamlessly within within the, the urban centers. The, and then from there now with autonomous trucks, you don't need to think about drivers so much. Not like we want to uh, people to be unemployed, but then how can we leverage on technology and the people are doing driving can even be doing more uh, uh, human-related activities uh, than, than just driving. Then we also think of electric trucks, which is uh, one way of attaining sustainability and reducing uh, uh, emissions. Uh, but still there are questions about how far can these trucks go? How, how good are the batteries? Can it support maybe 500 kilometers or 300 kilometers? What about the charging time? Uh, who, who pays for that charging time? When you are fueling, it's maybe five minutes, the truck is full of petrol and it can, it can start moving. But if, you are, if your truck, you don't buy a truck so that you can pack it somewhere charging, you buy a truck so that it can keep moving. And so those are the questions that we need to ask ourselves about the idle time, especially when it comes to, to this particular uh, electric trucks. Maybe if we can have roads where the trucks can be charging as they move, uh, maybe that can be a very good innovation. Uh, yeah. Then we talk of uh, GPS uh, tracking and routing. That is real time uh, 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 sharing of information so that you can optimize uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, on routing. That is a very important aspect so that you can be able to, to reduce cost. Sometimes, uh, we get maybe our our trucks on the roads and uh, they, they just drive into already a congested road. But if we had this particular information regarding that a particular corridor has a bottleneck, but you can navigate the bottleneck through a, a different route, that is what we need. That is what technology can do for us. So it will increase uh, efficiencies. Now, cloud-based technologies can also help us to be able to share real-time in, uh, uh, information so that you don't need to, to be moving freight or goods to a particular warehouse when the warehouse is already full. Then the trucks have to keep on waiting there for three days to offload. So this can be reduced when you make use of technology that uh, real-time, the driver can be told, no, don't deliver here, go and deliver in a different warehouse. Then you, you save maybe a day or two days sometimes. So we also have robotics and automation, which can be used in warehouses. And then you can increase warehouse productivity and, uh, and, and accuracy. And also the, the, the common problem with warehousing, which is bill fridge. Eh? You keep on losing goods. Uh, a robot is not going to steal from you any day. So it will always be there. So we also have a blockchain technology. Uh, by the way, we get that Maesk uh, International is really using this uh, uh, blockchain technology to increase uh, uh, transparency, to increase traceability, and also to improve on security. 
which is, uh, which is very key. Now, then we get that uh, advanced analytics. Now, how do you leverage on data? Are you collecting data in your organization? Are, are transport companies collecting data? And if they are collecting the data, where are they storing the data? And are they analyzing that data? So uh, maybe this is an opportunity that uh, 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 logistics and uh, transport companies can leverage on universities. Because now universities, we're developing skills on data analytics, developing skills on how we can make use uh, of uh, big data to make decisions. Then that particular analytics will help us to be able to know which, which areas are we weak, which areas are we strong, so that we can always, we can always improve. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, feel very welcome to this particular forum and uh, let's do our best in the engagement. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Josh. Really appreciate always being here for us and uh, always supporting the Transport Forum. And uh, we're looking forward to many events. University of January usually do four events per year, sometimes more with the Transport Forum. So, and always a royal treatment here. Thank you very much. We really appreciate that. Ladies and gents, um, right. Our first subject matter speaker today is the platinum sponsor of the Transport Forum, Mr. Jaco Leroux. He's the Chief Technology Officer, C-Track Africa. He's going to talk about adaptive technologies to support an ever-changing transport landscape. Thank you, Jaco. Good morning, everybody, and thank you for having c -Track at this event. Um, I'm today going to cover um, just how technology and the landscape that we currently sit in from a South African perspective has a big influence on decision making about the technologies you use. So we all know in, in today's time in South Africa, uh, load shedding is playing a big part of everybody's days in in uh, in their businesses. So so that it obviously has a it has an impact on crime, has an impact on on our economy. And what we realized from a sea track perspective uh, a few years ago is that we we need to adapt our technologies to cope with these sort of impacts that you have, because you've got service providers that in some regions just can't keep the communications up. Now, in our industry, communications plays a big role because we need to get the data to the back ends. So what do you do? How do you, how do you uh, circumvent that problem um, with technology? There's only so much you can do, but we, we then decided to embark on, on this journey and assist companies and the drivers because the drivers are exposed. Um, the, the, the safety and the crime is impacting the driver just as well as the businesses. And in this, in this economy, you also find that businesses maybe grinds their, their, their workers harder because you've got longer times on the roads, um, all those aspects do play a role. And when you disconnected from a back end, what do you do? You can have any technology in the vehicle, but that that causes a problem. And then I think secondly, what I want to cover is is the real time aspect. In today's lives, you can't wait in some cases 10 or 20 minutes for somebody to analyze data. Um, we're moving into an age where historical data doesn't play that big role, but you need to make decisions on the spot. 
and what technologies and adaption we did as a company to overcome that. So firstly, we, we're trying to empower our customers through the, our technologies and improve their utilization, the safety and the aspects that they need to run their businesses. And through that, as I said, we, we also think of the driver so that he has real-time information or the systems in the vehicle can make decisions and assist based on whatever the business rules the companies uh, require. But saying that, we also know that technology has become very expensive. In the last few years over COVID, the guys that's involved in, in, in on the tech side, on the hardware side, we know that there was a worldwide component shortage. So now suddenly, except for our load shedding problem, we've got influences internationally on getting product or designing. So what do you do? And that also increased the, the, the cost of the technology, which obviously then filters through to the end user or the end customer. So looking at all of that, um, we, we started to go on a journey whereby, first of all, our designs from a hardware perspective is such a way that every customer's needs doesn't require different software or different hardware. We are able to configure devices over the air so that we can adapt the response of that IoT device in the vehicle to the business needs. And I'll, I'll go in more detail and, and give examples. It is also important to know that in this time, our stats show that um, drivers spend on average 13 hours a day driving. So that excludes the time you stop to refuel or whatever the case might be. So if you add all that hours, there's, there, there's a huge amount of drivers on the road doing about 12,000 kilometers a month, which needs to be looked after. So in, in that case, we... we and, and, and I'll, I'll do it in more detail in the, in the last slide, but we then started to move over to the concept of edge. So, and, and, and making decisions within the vehicle, within your IoT device, and sending the information back. So what's the benefit there? So traditionally, data is sent to the back end, and there's maybe a bureau or somebody there looking at the information and making decisions, phoning the driver or whatever the, the SOP might be. In our case, we collect about 18 billion records of data a year. So now you sit with a problem because you're going to have a huge amount of people involved from an operational perspective. A, B is the, the technology is sometimes very advanced and leaving that to your end customer to sort out issues is also not going to work. So that's why we um, embarked on, on this journey of the edge uh, technology. So just maybe before we go into the edge side, um, we also changed our view on how do we look at data? So, so the people that are familiar with the, with the um, terminology of driver behavior, maybe from your... Uh, people that's at discovery, um, it's, a, it's, it's a way that they measure how good people drive. But most people only look at the negative part of it. Was there a horse braking? Was there a swerve? And that all gets calculated. And then in the end, in the driver debrief, that technology or, or that score is then held against that driver. So we, we change that as well. And there's positive sides in a horse break or a swerve because maybe somebody ran in front of your vehicle. So how do we do that? You have to do that real time as well from an edge perspective so that you can warn the driver in certain uh, cases and send the data back to the back end so that after a month you can do the calculations with regards to the score. So that was also just a change from the way that we approach and we work with data. So this edge thing that I talked about. 
So in short, traditional, as I said, data sent, is get sent into a cloud or a backend and gets calculated and things get gets done with that data. What we have done is we've implemented a, a way where decisions is made in the vehicle. So you've got three clients with three different business cases. We can remotely with the same hardware update their business cases and um, perform these actions that the business cases require. So what's the benefit? If we go back to the load shedding side of things, you've got a driver that's going into an area whereby there's maybe some safety issues. One of our clients, um, for instance, used uh, maintenance on the vehicles. If they go onto a gravel road, the, the, the driver must not drive as fast as on a normal tow road for obvious reasons. So that we did with the IoT device on the edge and it detects where the guy is driving and it limps the vehicle when it actually enters that zone. The next guy maybe wants to measure if his driver is using his safety belt. The vehicle won't start, but if you are in an area where there's no GSM coverage at the stage when he wants to start the vehicle and you don't, do not make those decisions on the edge, what do you do? The vehicle just stands. So, so from that perspective, we implemented that technology so that there's many use cases where, where you can pretty much have any input into our device and remotely make that decision on what is your use case. Mining, for instance, there's certain areas that vehicles may only drive a certain speed, but it's different for different mines, for different areas. And again, we, uh, we, we are able to, to manage that. So with that whole disconnectivity part and bringing in edge camera as well, we, we combine those two technologies where events that happens or on the camera or on the IoT device makes decisions in the vehicle and then executes it there. So to assist the driver from a fatigue point of view, we measure fatigue from a camera perspective, we measure fatigue from a driving perspective. So again, um, you don't need connectivity anymore to be able to determine those things because it happens in the device from an edge perspective. So from, from, from that perspective is, is sort of the ways that, that C-Track um, is, is trying to work around our daily challenges and and improve the safety for the driver, but still have, have the end customer um, um, in, in the picture from a data perspective. Um, maybe just the previous slide, um, and we'll hope you can see it. Just, just an interesting sake, that map is not a map that was created by a supplier, that is our data. So that map was pretty much created through a um, process that we did, and it actually draws the map of South Africa. And through that, just from a closing point of view, I believe there's so many data available which we can utilize, and, and the industry should help each other in creating that use cases to, to, to utilize this data in, in making uh, our roads a better and safer place and optimizing uh, the freight in South Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, C-Track. Very interesting presentation. Innovation of note. And uh, uh, we really appreciate your um, co -sponsor, well, platinum sponsorship of the Transport Forum. Um, and they're also planning many events with the Transport Forum and initiatives. So we're looking forward to that. Thank you very much, C-Track. Ladies and gents, um, now we're going to have our first online presentation from Italy. Um, and the topic is the railway maintenance evolution from screwdriver to artificial intelligence. I just want to hear whether our Italian people are online and if we can hear you, if you can engage with us, please. Good morning, Good morning, everyone. Can you hear us? We can hear and see you, yes. And see you. 
Okay, thank you. <laughs> Welcome to the Transport Forum, ladies and uh, uh, the gents. Um, and uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing your names correctly. Maybe you can help me. It's Matteo Genovese and Andrea Gatti. Is that correct? Yes, correct. Yes, correct. <laughs> All right. Okay. So thank you very much. And we're looking forward to listening to you and the innovation you guys are doing there in Italy. We'd like to learn from you. So you're welcome to proceed. Are you going to share your own screen? Okay. Can you see our screen? We can. You can that, that's oh. it. Perfect. You can continue. Thank you. Okay. Perfect. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Andrea Gatti. And today, me and, me and uh, my colleague, uh, Matteo Genovese, we will uh, present you um, our idea of um, our topic uh, that is related to from screwdriver to artificial intelligence. Um, we start from a brief presentation of our Italian company, uh, Accent Group. Uh, Accent is an uh, um, Italian-based company. So we are speaking from Italy. Uh, Milan, especially, uh, and uh, our mission is to use to, uh, technology to simplify uh, all that uh, complex uh, process. Uh, Accent is composed by two main solutions. One is uh, Accent Technology Solution, uh, and the second one is uh, Accent System Engineering. But uh, uh, the main topic is related to the transport and mo mobility uh, innovation. Uh, our expertise is divided into four main uh, pillars. The, the first one is uh, information technologies. Uh, the second one, industrial and civil uh, maintenance engineering, uh, industry 4.0, uh, and the last one, um, R, R and D uh, and uh, training. Uh, our, uh, now we, we go on with especially the topic related to the industrial and civil uh, maintenance engineering, but it's also related to also the other pillar. Um, our main uh, clients in, uh, in Europe and especially in Italy are Asom, Siemens, Bombardier, Captrain, Baptec, uh, and data and, uh, and so on, FS uh, and so on. We start uh, from uh, a brief presentation of uh, the maintenance, the traditional maintenance uh, one, that it's related to the preventive maintenance and the corrective maintenance. The preventive maintenance is related, uh, is a fixed. So um, all the activity are set by the maintenance plan that is given uh, um, um, from the, um, the uh, product of uh, the trains and uh, the preventive maintenance uh, it consists of high cost in terms of personal and low cost in terms of uh, material. Instead, the corrective maintenance is a run to failure activity. Uh, and so uh, I perform the corrective maintenance after um, the following of a fault of the system. Uh, and so I have an high, an high cost uh, and uh, high cost in terms of, uh, and also high skill personal to perform this uh, corrective acti uh, activity. This is the traditional maintenance. We can go deeper into these uh, two main uh, topics, the preventive one. So it's a type of maintenance based a set of activity defined into the maintenance plan of the running stock. Uh, and this maintenance activity can, uh, can be performed on kilometric based or temporal based. Instead, the corrective maintenance is a reactive maintenance, so a run to failure activity, which consists of uh, uh, in uh, performing the activity uh, only after that a fault of course. Let's go. Uh, so let's uh, now uh, it's time to think different about uh, maintenance. And so, uh, what are the possibility the possibility for improvement given from the introduction of innovative approach? Which uh, frontiers are, are we opening? Uh, so now it's time to be innovative. So this is our purpose. So the new scenario is uh, divided into uh, predictive maintenance that can be uh, seen as on condition based maintenance. So the one that you can see on the right top of the slide and uh, uh, the predictive maintenance based on machine learning algorithms. And these two activity uh, is the innovation part, and they, they are used also 
to have saving in cost and also the, uh, a better management of uh, spare parts related to the training. Uh, so, on condition based maintenance is a maintenance strategy that monitors the actual condition of the asset in order to anticipate and uh, predict a possible fault into the asset uh, in general. Uh, now we apply it to the rolling stock. Instead, the, so with the, a rule engine, uh, we, uh, the rule engine allows to analyze an amount of data automatically and they can perform all the activity uh, automatically. Uh, the artificial intelligence also is an automatic activity that using machine learning and when needed also IoT solution uh, applied to the asset to have an higher amount of data that can be analyzed and also uh, can, can be performed this uh, machine learning algorithm. Uh, so the new maintenance uh, scenario increases uh, uh, efficiency and efficacy. Uh, to obtain valid result into the industrial company is necessary to improve efficiency uh, and efficacy uh, of the maintenance. The maintenance uh, service has a strategic role into the industrial scenario and also IoT sensor uh, and the support of IT is necessary to perform a better maintenance uh, process. Uh, so to, uh, to increase this uh, efficiency is uh, uh, necessary an higher investment cost. So uh, the application of this system that uh, we call it, it uh, control room uh, necessitates an uh, um, investment into the first period, uh, as you can see on the rounded uh, and the dotted um, circle, blue circle into the left of the graph. Uh, and after that, I can perform, uh, um, I have a reduction of costs related to the application of this control rule system uh, along all the life of the asset. And here we have the saving uh, that this uh, initial investment uh, produce. Uh, so the investigation uh, control room approach just three main uh, strategic purposes. So the industrialization of maintenance, increase of efficiency uh, and efficacy of the maintenance. So we want uh, we want to move from an artesian um, uh, activity, uh, maintenance activity, to a uh, industrial uh, maintenance activity. So for the artesian uh, maintenance. We have an high skills and very focused specialization, uh, self management of the work, self management of the process, and also all the expertise are normally in one person. In, in, instead, the industrial one, we can spread the, uh, the experience, uh, we can uh, um, guide all, the, all this activity, also through service order that we deepen it uh, in, uh, later on and uh, standard, the standardized uh, process and the workflow that it's related to uh, perform, to increase also the standardization of the activity can perform a, um, a more uh, efficient, efficiency uh, activity. Uh, so we want to, uh, to move from maintenance is a work. And, uh, uh, and so maintenance uh, must be uh, industrialized. So it's necessary to industrialize all this workflow. Uh, so the industrial uh, activity must be standardized, repeatable, compliant, and uh, perform all the, qual the quality requirements. Um, the, the effort must be provided is, is driven to support the activities of two pillars of its work, uh, competence, enhance and improve the competence, assure the complete distribution of competencies, and also the processes. Define standard process to work, define rule, and uh, uh, make work uh, uh, compatible with quality standard. Um, so the new maintenance uh, scenario, um, require a uh, innovation and this is uh, this innovation is given uh, through the condition based maintenance so cbm and the predicting maintenance methods uh, so the activity performed um, 
near the train, but be compliant with also the activity that can be performed abroad from this uh, data collect or control room, uh, and they have to move uh, all together. The traditional maintenance uh, is uh, uh, the system of uh, a traditional maintenance is uh, obsolete. So I have the failure into the asset, in this case, into the, the train. I perform the data download from the train. I analyze it. And, uh, and after that, I can def define the maintenance task that uh, to be performed before uh, the maintenance activity can start. And this is a really time consuming uh, activity. And so it's better to move uh, to um, to move to a um, parallelism between this activity. And so I have uh, a continuous data download, data analysis, and also the definition of maintenance all together. And so I also can uh, predict the, the failure and perform this activity before the failure happens. Uh, so the standard method, uh, it's a process, uh, it's um, uh, um, all the, um, the data discharge are performed manually. And also I have the train that is stationary into the maintenance depot. And this process is slow and does not allow you to receive data in real time. And so to have a more efficient uh, activity, we need to have data discharge uh, by the train uh, in real time or near real time. And also we can perform all the, the algorithm and process all of this uh, activity um, uh, from away the, the train. Now I leave the floor to Matteo that go on with this presentation. Okay, thank you, Andrea. And now we keep the focus about uh, the control room. Uh, the control room is a set of analysis and data processes, uh, methodologies and tools aimed to optimizing uh, uh, the diagnostic systems and all the maintenance process. In the control room, uh, highly, highly skilled and experienced um, figures uh, are involved and they, um, their high specialization, specialization allow to uh, accurate data analysis and diagnostic uh, um, analysis. So um, through the processes of the control room, it's possible to monitor any source of data, thus passing from raw and uh, interpreted uh, information to solutions and punctual uh, reporting. So using automated analysis and uh, rules and data analysis, analyst, uh, control room algorithm accurately uh, identify deviations and drift of uh, functional parameters that uh, can determine the onset failures. So uh, the control room algorithm actually uh, identify deviations uh, and drift of functional par parameters can determine the uh, failures before that uh, they occur. So this type of maintenance is called on condition and predictive. So uh, which is uh, the um, flow about uh, the control room? So, uh, as you can see in the picture, the flow uh, um, that all the inputs that are involved in the control room um, are data that are um, that came from uh, the sensor installed by on the train or on the vehicles. So um, the environment, um, environment environmental data and uh, additional external data are uh, in input of the control room that with uh, some data processing and data mining are um, put in output from the control room with corrective actions and the statics and the continuous improvement actions. So these are quick term actions and medium term actions that can be performed with the maintenance process to be um, to have an uh, efficiency and efficacy of the maintenance process with uh, the new and innovative methods. So which are the figures that are involved in the control room? The first one is a data scientist that is the data expert and analyze all the diagnostic data that are involved on the train, on the rolling stocks, on the other vehicles about mobility. So he, um, about his evaluations on this data, uh, make uh, open or uh, analyze some service order to the train expert or especially to service order man manager. So the train expert uh, develops a troubleshooting guide, make rules, 
to um, set when a, a failure can uh, came uh, on the train before the failure occurs. So um, the use of the data scientist and the train expert can optimize the maintenance process with the use also with the, of the service order manager. So the service order manager manages all the workflow in the depot and receives the service order from the data train expert and data scientist with the use of the control room to make a um, efficiency of the, all the process of maintenance with a continuous workflow. So the workflow that uh, you can see in the picture in the um, in this system of the control room uh, is uh, a uh, is a workflow when where the data came from the, um, the train and are sent to uh, the control room to the to the data scientist. So the data scientist uh, analyze the data with the support of the train expert and with the use of the rules um, created by the train expert, uh, open or not, a work order with a troubleshooting guide. So um, this uh, um, workflow in output from the control room, it's useful to um, service order manager to optimize the maintenance process with a um, depot or remote work team to make the efficiency on the, the train or the vehicles more efficient and fast, faster. So this is the continuous improvement uh, um, that is involved in the system of the control room. Uh, as you can see, uh, the train expert received feedbacks from the, depo the, the depot uh, from the, the service order manager. So the service order manager informs the control room about the possible improvement in the rules and troubleshooting guide. So this continuous improvement and this continuous flow of, inf of uh, information about these figures, it's uh, very important to make uh, the uh, maintenance process uh, more efficient and efficacy uh, as possible. So which is the accent role about uh, the use of the control room? Uh, now uh, we can develop a solution to acquire and analyze data to extract usable information and make it uh, available for the main companies. So we can extract the data from the train or the vehicles and put in output uh, useful information to good interpretate uh, uh, that uh, with the use of, uh, of our control room. So we keep now the focus about uh, our solution. We call it control room. So um, we, have, we have a control room that can show a um, general overview about the status of the fleet. Uh, where you can find the, the general reports of, about the rolling stock and uh, with some graphical representation or uh, KPI, KV performance indicator, you can see the correct status of the train with the presence or not of faults in, on the vehicles and uh, all the fleet. About the analysis of the data, uh, the data, uh, the train expert can uh, see in our control room uh, which are the data that um, diagnostic data that are coming from the train or uh, on the vehicles and with our interactive dashboard view and managing the data to obtain a real-time monitoring so it make it possible to trace uh, the appearance of the anom anomalies on the train and all, all these elements are connected with the iot uh, systems or sensor devices installed on the on the train to keep uh, the maintenance monitoring uh, on real time also, the key performance indicators are um, very good solutions to uh, trace in real time which is the status of the train or of the fleet um, in, the, in this moment when you see our application about to keep in monitoring uh, how the subsystems of a vehicle or um, of a train, um, their status are in this moment. Also, with the concept of preventive maintenance, it's very important in the use of our control room to generate automatic emails when uh, uh, preventive maintenance it's, um, it's important to, uh, to set on a train when, um, of course, a failure on, uh, on the main trains. So also, a fleet status monitoring is performed uh, by our solutions. And also, the use of the monitoring and faults and status on the, co um, the current, uh, um, on the current uh, uh, real time, you can see uh, and open work orders in case of need uh, when a failure occurs on the rolling stock. And the creation of the rules that um, are performed by the figures of the train expert are very important to 
set automatic opening of the work orders by the system when a, a new failure uh, is occur on a, a train or on a rolling stock. The main topic of our control room is also the implementation of machine learning and the predictive algorithm to keep in real time the predictive maintenance. So when a system um, keep all the big data that are receiving of, uh, on a train, uh, our solution analyze and process all the data, all the historic data uh, diagnostic from the train, train and keep in output a um, predictive maintenance, a predictive graph to uh, say when a failure uh, could be um, occurs on uh, the rolling stock. And the uh, final uh, modules of our solution of our, our control room is to keep a monitoring of the processing status of the work order. So to keep the um, workflow between the train expert and the service order manager on the depots, it's important to uh, know in real time which is the status of the work orders and which is the status of the maintenance on the um, different uh, trains or different vehicles. So uh, with this model, you can see uh, which is the current status uh, of that. And uh, we thank you for your attention and thank you to everyone. Thank you so much, gentlemen. What an excellent presentation. It was so interesting to see the journey from, from traditional maintenance to innovation and also the context in terms of you know understanding the value proposition of that control room and the relevant software and then also the i think also a big role that's playing there's all the expertise being connected uh, in this operational space to to do maintenance and uh, obviously preventative and predictive maintenance uh, rather than the traditional um gents i just want to know um um, Jan, can you give me the, the, the program, please? We're going to have a, a panel discussion a little bit later on, around about 12 ish, maybe you're running a bit early. Uh, are you going to stay online or you want to take questions now? Can you still hear us? Yes. We can uh, hear you. <laughs> okay, great. Now, I just want to know whether you guys are going to stay on for the panel discussion, which so should be around uh, run about, uh, uh, it will be around about quarter to one. No, sorry, sorry. Let me just see here. About 12 o'clock, 10 to 12, run about. Or do you want to take questions now? If there are some questions, uh, no problem. Okay, we let me look at the right audience. Now. We are also um, looking at uh, the chat, so yes. prefer to write it there. It's not a problem. Let's check, get the lights on here in the auditorium. Um, the people on Zoom and YouTube, you're welcome to text questions to the presenters. Um, are there any, is there anybody in the audience who want to ask a question? Okay, there is one question. Thank you, Franz. Thanks, Harry. Yeah, I just, uh, I enjoyed your talk. Um, do you do predictive maintenance only on the rolling stock or is it, is it also on the, the installed rail infrastructure? Yeah, one uh, of the main strengths of uh, this uh, application, this control room, is uh, related that we can monitor an asset. It's not uh, the right uh, cho choice to do uh, monitoring uh, only the train. So it's possible also to use it uh, into monitoring uh, some uh, structural, uh, structural stuff uh, as well uh, without any, any problem. We also applied this control room to monitor uh, the infrastructure in, uh, in, uh, in Italy also and as data collector and data, data, data analyst, also knowing the output that can be performed by this control room. And uh, also the control room is high, uh, 
customizable, and so it's possible to monitor infrastructure uh, also, also this. Thank you for that answer. There's a question on, on uh, Zoom from Gwen Foster. She's asking, would the system control room cater for traceability? Um, uh, can you repeat the, the question, please? <laughs> Gwen, you're welcome to unmute and, and talk to the gentleman. Thank you very much. Um, my question is the use of technology and auto identification of goods and the whole concept of traceability of goods and identifying where they are and potentially what the status is. One of the considerations is um, sort of agri-hub services, if I can put it that way. And the question is whether or not the control room, whether or not your concept, whether you have considered extending the offering to include traceability of goods on the truck or on the train or whatever the case might be. Uh, so uh, using uh, GPS data that come from, we can use traceability in this sense. Do you mean uh, something like, like this? Uh, because uh, now we use the, the GPS system uh, to have the traceability of the, the train, uh, for example. And so we can uh, we know uh, in uh, near real time uh, where the train is, when, uh, when the train is located. No, agreed. I would imagine this would be a completely new layer. So perhaps it's a consideration. Once you've got the train and you've got the stations identified and you've got a common gauge railway line and all of that sort of stuff, it comes down to being able to put different things onto the trucks. So it comes down to monitoring the contents as well. Um, so, for instance, if we are sending containers down to the port, those containers would be uniquely identified. Those containers would have goods inside that are uniquely identified. So it's that dimension. I was just simply interested to know, you seem to have all the basics, if I can put it that way. I was just interested to know whether traceability was on the radar. Uh, yes, uh, we can think something uh, like this, also connecting uh, the data that come from uh, different, uh, dif uh, different IoT system. So it's something that can, uh, can be analyzed. No, that's great. Thank you. The South African Smart Borders Project would be a good pickup point. Thanks very much. Very interesting. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. You're all right. Thank you, gentlemen. Any other questions in the audience? You're already comfortable? All right. Let me just have a last check on the YouTube. See the YouTube guys are comfortable. All right. So. Gentlemen from Italy, thank you very much for, for participating in this event. We really appreciate your participation. And uh, I'm quite sure a lot of people will still contact you because this file is going to be on YouTube for some time. And uh, we really appreciate sharing your expertise with us and all the best for good products in the future. Thank you so much. We really well, appreciate thank it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Let's let us let's just sort out our technology here. There we go. Thank you, Jan. Jan is always such a good support to me. And Sam Dance is sweating behind that table. <laughs> Ladies and gents, um, we're going to have a very in interesting presentation as well now. It's Mr. Franz Strurich. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Israel Labs. And he's going to talk about revolutionizing 
Um, the rail vandal proof technology, much needed for South Africa. Indeed, much needed. Thank you very much, Franz. Thanks, Harry. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So a real privilege for me to, to speak with you today. Uh, thanks a lot to Harry and the, the Transport Forum for this opportunity. Um, and I have to admit, when, when Harry asked me you know, to come up with a name for this talk, I was slightly stumped. And you know, we just sort of threw something out there. But now, um, looking back at this, you know, it, it feels a little bit too bold. Um, so. So let's see where this goes. But basically, it's my uh, my my first public um, sort of talk on on what we're doing at Easyway Labs. So you, you're privileged to to see sort of the um, unveiling of what we've been busy with with for the last uh, last year or so. Um, so the most important things first. Now this is my family, my lovely wife Linka. We've been married for almost 20 years, and my two boys, David and Simon. Uh, so we live in Somerset West, in the Republic of the Western Cape. Um, and important note, you'll see there's a Stormers flag in the background there. Um, I am not a Stormers fan. I'm a, I'm a very staunch Blue Bull supporter, born and bred here in Pretoria. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so it's actually so so refreshing and nice to be to be back here. I always enjoy the people and the great weather. Um, so thanks thanks a lot for having me. Um, I'm passionate about technology, people, and business. And where these things come together, you know, interesting things happen. Uh, so I'm going to share a bit about my story with you today. Um, you know, it starts here at the University of Pretoria, where I did my engineering degree um, early 2000s. And I started in the crypto industry. So that was doing um, hardware security modules and you know, long before crypto was a thing. So I'm, I'm an engineer at heart, um, but I always had this people and business thing in the back of my mind. And so in 2006, I started a tech company that was focused on helping people to see what they can't using radar and computer vision. So still very technical, um, but, but a little bit more customer focused, a lot of custom solutions like you would see on this, on this picture, complex things. Um, and that was a really interesting journey for, for about 10 years. Um, I was on that journey. And then in 2015, the company was bought by Garmin. So that, that is also worth a talk in its own right. Um, but what's interesting to note there, Garmin really valued South African engineers. So they bought the company partly for, for the great team. So our engineers are really world-class, can, can uh, mix it up with anyone in the world. Um, and they also really like this little product for the, for the cyclists. I know how you use cycle. Uh, this is the Garmin Varia radar. So it's a little device you clip onto the back of your bicycle and then it tells you basically where the cars are behind you, how far they are, how fast they're moving, and just to give you a bit more awareness of what's going on around you. Okay, so, so at this point, I think many of you may be glazing over thinking, okay, so what is this guy doing at the transport forum? <laughs> I have no, no experience in this industry. Um, well, it just so happens that that deep knowledge about radar and, um, and developing consumer products actually has some application um, in the railway industry. Um, so, so I'm going to try and connect those, those dots for us. Um, I think also the reason I'm in the railway industry specific now is I'm a patriotic South African. So I think like all of you here, yeah, um, you know, we want to make a difference. And 
and seeing the rail industry um, around 2018, seeing the challenges there, I realized that this is um, you know, a problem that needs to be addressed. So I saw a few interesting things. Um, firstly, cable theft is, uh, is a major problem, as all of you know. Lots of copper cable um, surrounding these, these railway lines. And, and also most of the sensors are fed by these copper cables. So cables get stolen, you know, everything falls over. Um, and the second interesting problem for me was rail breaks. So you have, let's say, the Saldana Sishian railway line. It's about 700 kilometers. So every year you have maybe 20 breaks on that line. And that is because of the temperature changes along the line. So, so a rail will physically break. And that's not a problem per se. It's something that happens. But if it's undetected, it can cause derailments. And we have derailments every year. And those derailments cost north of 100 million rand on average per derailment, but the cost to the country is actually far greater. There's, uh, I mean, this week there was, there were all these trucks in, I think, at Richmond, uh, all these coal trucks for kilometers. So I mean, that is a spillover effects of, of railway, the railway industry not working as it should. So a question we have to ask is why do people vandalize? You know, what is the source of this? And, and so my, you know, I'm not an expert at this, but my preliminary investigation <laughs> showed that this is more predatory. It's more people stealing things because they can sell it and get something out of it. It's not as much um, what you would have maybe at ESCOM where people are, are trying to just um, sabotage. Thank you. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's predatory. And, and if we apply rational choice theory to this, um, we, can, we can say that people make these choices to vandalize based on the perceived cost and the benefit they get. So, so people consider this. If it's easy to vandalize something and you can get a lot out of it, then people will do it. Um, so in our case, if we look at some of the technologies that, that's used um, on the Saldana Session line, they've got these um, rail sonic rail brake detection sensors. And they typically have big solar panels. They've got big batteries like car batteries next to the rail. So the benefit is, uh, is tangible if you steal that. And um, it's not that difficult. Those lines are typically you know, too long to, to man. Um, so I think the old technology along the railway typically doesn't serve that, that equation very well. Um, so we have to find ways of increasing the cost of, of actually vandalizing and reducing the benefit that people can get from that. Now, in addition to, to the weaknesses maybe in the existing technology, there's also you know, something that stood out for me is how this technology hasn't really evolved that much in the last hundred years. And uh, now I'm sure um, it's a big generalization. So, um, in railway, there, might, there were a lot of advances, but core sensors like um, you get track track circuits is a really core component in, in railways. That's been around since 1870. Um, you know, you've got axle counters, I think it's 1960s. And so this tech has really sort of stood still while the rest of the world has moved on. So, I um, mean, we've, we've had massive technological advances. Um, but it hasn't been necessary for railways to, to move because it's been working. It's, it's, uh, just like in aviation, it's no need to change something that's working. But now we're at a point where I think it, it makes sense to, to move with the times. Um, so a few technological shifts that are worth taking note of. And I realize I'm preaching to the converted. Also listening to, to some of this, the previous speakers, you, you guys have uh, heard this kind of thing very often. So... I don't want to bore you to death with this, but this is relevant. We are moving from analog to digital now, over the last 60 years. That's, that's a common trend. In digital, you have a lot more intelligence, a lot more possibilities. Um, we're moving from custom to off the shelf. And off the shelf doesn't mean that you, know, you, you buy the sensor and take a lot. It just means maybe in the rail industry that you're not going to develop custom ICs for everything you do. Um, we're moving from a few very expensive sensors to more ubiquitous sensors, a lot more affordable, 
uh, but a lot more redundancy as well. Um, we're moving from single purpose to multi-purpose. And then definitely disconnected to connected, maybe Yaku to the edge <laughs> along with that. Um, and then to, to dynamic systems, learning systems, really to link up with, with Accent, what they're doing is, you know, these, these systems are constantly growing, evolving, employing AI. It's no longer just a static system that you install and it just does one thing all the time. So a, a good example of this, practical example, um, where I live, if you drive from Somerset West over Sir Larry's Pass, you used to look out for speed cameras. You'd see like a big speed camera, digital or analog device basically standing there, radar, uh, just one thing that it does, um, expensive, not connected. You know, but these days you don't see that. It's average speed enforcement. So they have cameras that are off the shelf, super intelligent. Uh, these cameras are multi-purpose. They use it to, to monitor traffic flow, to track perpetrators, you know, if, if, if someone, someone is wanted by the police. Um, you know, these cameras are constantly, constantly learning to do new things. Um, and they're constantly connected. So, so that's definitely where the world has moved. So keeping all of this in, my, in mind, um, our solution is called TrackView. Um, so TrackView is an IoT device installed on the railway that is virtually vandal proof. So it's installed on a sleeper wrapped with three millimeter steel with two steel cables connected to the rail. So extremely difficult to remove. Uh, but it's also sort of worthless to remove. You can't really do a lot with, with that. Um, it's got no copper cables, no big batteries, and no big solar panels. Um, okay, so it's great if you put something useless on the railway, but <laughs> and nobody can steal it, but what does it actually do? So it turns out TrackView has quite a, quite a few interesting features. The, the core features of this device is, is basically to pick up a train on the railway track um, to within a meter accuracy over a four kilometer stretch. Um, and we also detect rail brakes, which is, which is key, also to within a meter resolution. Um, and this is done with, with a few microwatts, so using almost no power. Um, so that allows us really to get away from, from any, any big peripherals or big, you know, copper cabling. Um, but these core functions are great on their own. But what, this, what makes this kind of platform a lot more valuable is actually the, the value-added service that grows on this. So a few things that, that, that you can do is it's train completion. So I know everyone here is not, not a rail expert, but that's a big issue in the rail industry, you know, to know if a train is maybe missing one of its, uh, one of its carriages. Um, the potential for moving block. So as you want to put more trains into a single you know, piece on a piece of track, you want to be able to dynamically change the block sizes of those tracks. But this is, it's quite technical, but, but this kind of thing opens up. Um, obviously built-in tamper detection, early warning systems. Um, you can detect flat wheels. I actually think our sensors should, will, will work really well with uh, with the accent guys, with what they're doing. It, um, it really, there's a lot of synergy there. Um, we can also detect floods, uh, monitor the ballast. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of really interesting things. And so this is not black magic. I'm, I'm sure you're thinking now, so how, how does this work? Um, it's actually quite simple. It's a, you can, you can think um, conceptually of radar for a railway track. So we use the railway track as the medium. Um, the two cables connected to the rails um, basically complete the circuit and we, 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 um, we basically send small pulses of electricity into the rails. And you know, as the train approaches, it also closes the circuit and, and um, changes some of the dynamics. So we, we're using time of flight. So you can see how quickly the, the pulses move through, but also then time domain reflectometry. So again, 
might be too technical for this talk, but um, whenever there is a, a change in impedance in the railway, so maybe, you know what we've seen is maybe there's a bad bond, a thermite weld somewhere that's not great, then we get a reflection from that. So, so we, we, we both see the position of, of the train approaching, um, but we can also get all sorts of other interesting bits and pieces from, from our, our sensor. Um, oh, is that the end for me? I think I missed the slide here. Any case, um, what is the status of our project? Maybe just a moment, Ari. Um, we've we've got a patent which is um, uh, currently in the process in the US. We are funded by the Technology Innovation Agency very recently, so very excited about that. Um, we have a technology demonstrator. I'm going to just hold it up, just, just to have proof. So, so this is this is not to be installed on a railway track. This is actually a, for for lab use. So this does um, all the magic and has a, has a lot of extra features to be able to to prove the technology in a lab environment. Um, so, so our next step basically is to um, to move ahead with commercialization, work with closely with uh, with industry partners to to prove this technology in the real world. So I think we we need your your support. We need your input. I would I would value any feedback um, from this forum. And then you know I started saying that you know our our title for this talk is maybe a bit bold, but I would like to conclude by saying I think if we look at the state of of rail in South Africa, um, you know we have to be bold, and we have to to come up with solutions and build. Um, you know, those solutions that we need in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you so much, Franz. Ladies and gents, I think this is innovations of Africa's in need of. I think of what's happening on our railways and the rail tracks. Uh, we urgently need this. So thank you for guys like yourselves being entrepreneurs and taking the lead. And I'm quite sure a lot of people are still going to start talking to you in future. Um, so thank you very much, Franz. He said he will be available for the panel discussion just now. Then you can ask questions. Thank you very much. Righty, ladies and gents, uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to talk, take a break. Just want to get our program up here. So it's a comfort break, um, and uh, please don't go far. I'll, I'm going to contact our, we've got two exciting online presentations. Uh, Louise Widget, I uh, was going to talk about new trends on digitization of the supply chain. And then Dr. Karin Fenter is going to talk about innovative technologies in support of safer road infrastructure. Both of them are very interesting presentations. Um, so I'm going to contact them and say, listen, can we start at 10 minutes early or so? while you're taking a break. But let's for now, let's say we see each other back here at 11 o'clock. All right, so take a nice break. There should be snacks and so on. Thank you very much. All right, let's hear uh, Dr. Karin Fenter, are you online? Can you hear us? Yes, Sari, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Will you be able to share your slides or shall we put on your slides? I would appreciate that I'm on my phone. Okay, let's let's hope it goes better. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so too because I'm in the Eastern Cape, so hopefully my little Vodacom dongle is going to do the, do the magic. Yeah, no, let's let's try and fix this. So just bear with me. I'm bringing up your slides in a few seconds. Thank you. Okay, Karin, we can see your slides. Thanks very much, Ari. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm sorry that I can't see um, who is all in the um, in the meeting, um, but I'll have a look afterwards. My name is Karin Fenter. I'm a senior researcher for the CSIR um, in the Smart Mobility Cluster, 
And today I wear two hats. Um, as a senior researcher for the CSIR, also representing other units from the CSIR with some of the research that we do. But I'm also the technical lead for the Limpopo Road Safety Program, which is funded by Anglo-American and it is um, executed or implemented by the Impact Catalyst. So you can go to the next slide. Okay. So I'm going to do a quick introduction and frame um, the research that we're currently busy with. Um, I'm going to frame it within the safe systems approach and the national road safety strategy. Um, then give you a brief overview of the CSR transport safety lab and the portfolio of uh, work that we're busy with there that has to do with uh, road safety and infrastructure. Um, then I'm going to give you an overview of the Impact Catalyst program and the innovate, innovation project um, that we are busy with. And then if there's any questions, I'll take questions. Thanks. Next slide. So um, we all know, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the cost of uh, crashes in our country is exorbitant. And if we think of the cost of unsafety, um, and we think of the money that we lended from the IMS a couple of years ago when COVID um, was here, we can actually pay back that money, that 153 billion rand, if we save the lives on the road. So it is currently um, our main focus uh, to look at ways and means to address road safety. Um, and part of that addressing road safety is to look at technology and um, innovative ways in which we can address um, and reduce the number of crashes on our roads. Next slide. So I'm not sure um, how well familiar um, the forum is with the safe systems approach. That the safe systems approach is a global best practice. And South Africa became a signatory to the uh, Decade of Action in 2011. And then um, for a decade, we didn't do much. Uh, and in 2021, we again became a signatory. And um, in 2015, the Department of Transport and Sunroll and RTMC and a number of uh, road authorities um, wrote the National Road Safety Strategy, and the National Road Safety Strategy is premised on the safe system approach. So for um, mostly the safe systems approach is a pillar approach, and it looks at institutional management, safer road users, safer vehicles, safer infrastructure, and then also at post-crash E. So in other words, um, being able to respond to crashes on our road in a manner that's quick and that we prevent um, lives lost as well as disabilities going forward. Next slide. So I think um, the forum might be more familiar with ISO 59001, which is also the um, standard which is used for the road traffic management system um, with the heavy vehicles. Um, but this is a framework for ISO 59001. And um, at the bottom, you see a number of functions. Um, so in terms of that pillar approach of the safe system, those are the institutional functions, the legislation, the coordination, the education, as well as the research and the monitoring and the evaluation. So the, the way we fit in is in doing the research to actually inform um, things that can make um, everything that happens on the road network um, a bit better. And if we look at our road network, we need to manage, first of all, the entry and exit of good drivers, educated drivers, but also um, roadworthy vehicles. Um, we need to manage the road, the road environment, as well as infrastructure. And then again, we have to look at the first crash key. The top of the um, pyramid is history. That is the social and the economic cost of crashes, the number of lives lost. So there's nothing that we can do about that. Where we can action um, interventions is on the network level. Thanks, Ari. Next slide. So there's certain principles um, for safer roads and um, the infrastructure needs to be managed. 
Um, we need to take cognizance of the function of the road, which is quite difficult in South Africa. We've got communities um, that creep up to the road. Uh, they, if there's public transport facilities, they move closer to the road um, to access uh, social services. So it's quite a challenge. But the idea is to keep the function of the road simple um, and to keep the function of the road for either access or for mobility. And along with that goes the setting of speed limits, access management and control, um, as well as um, the type of uh, traffic that, that you allow on the road or that you manage on the road. So that's some of the principles. Um, next slide. And the, the road environment um, within the safe system, the aim is to provide forgiving road environments. So in other words, not a situation where we continue to blame road users, although they need to be educated and they need to be um, aware of their actions and situationally aware of where and how they behave. We are saying that road safety is a shared responsibility. And as such, um, there's a need also for road authorities and for planners and for designers to take uh, responsibility for designing for giving roads. So in other words, if you as a human do make a mistake that you are able to recover from that mistake without dying or having a serious injury that will leave you disabled for the rest of your life. Um, so the research that we do is aimed at um, informing the design or the modification of uh, roads and uh, environments and infrastructure to make this happen. Next slide, please. Okay, so the CSIR um, a couple of years ago um, initiated a project which um, is now in its third year called the Transport Safety Lab. And currently we're only looking at research related to um, the road environment, but in future we would like to expand the capabilities to also include um, rail and um, much, much more further into the future, possible um, aviation or other modes of transport. And the, the purpose of this facility is um, we make use of so much research from elsewhere and we don't do our own research. So currently there's not a similar facility on the African continent. And um, the idea is to collect our own data and to develop our own solution. Thank you, next slide. So the methodologies in the building blocks um, consist of um, traditional approaches. Um, so we use traditional means such as crash investigations, um, things like that. But with this um, development in technology that has happened at such an accelerated pace, um, we now getting clever and um, we are being uh, better at using technology to, to actually conduct the research. And um, one of the main methodologies that we use is the naturalistic drivings methodology. And it is a methodology where we instrument the vehicle very much like drive cam or fleet cam, um, but the vehicle is instrumented with uh, a computer box, with um, it's connected to the CAN bus for acceleration, deceleration, cameras on the on the driver, as well as facing outwards. So the difference between this system and other systems is that we continuously collect data. We, something like DriveCam only gives you um, a few seconds before or after um, uh, the person needs a pothole or an incident happened. Um, we have continuous data um, of the road environment and of uh, driving behavior. So in other words, we are, for the first time, able to study normal um, driver behavior as well as things like traffic conflicts that could lead to serious accidents um, in, in an integrated way, which wasn't possible um, previously. So um, part of um, the analysis in taxi, takes into account the infrastructure and the road environment adjacent to where the driver is. Next slide, please. Um, 
with the Transport Safety Lab, the intent is to have a dedicated facility for this data collection. And I heard the lady uh, previously talking about the master data and standardization. So that's also something that we were that we are working towards. Um, the integration of all these different data formats and types of data um, to be compatible and usable with each other. And um, this is work in progress. And um, we are um, really excited about the possibilities um, that we, we can use this for. Next slide, please. So currently, um, some of the examples of the research support is um, a learner driver study that we did in 2019. We had um, a learner driver instructor whose vehicle was instrumented with this uh, naturalistic driving equipment. And we have um, a lot of image material that we are currently looking at to analyze um, the road environment and the um, infrastructure and the design of, for example, intersections um, to look at how that can be done in a better way to facilitate better driver um, education and better driver training. Um, then also, like I said, we're looking at um, uh, things like vehicle conflicts, uh, vehicle conflicts in terms of um, lane changing behavior, but also then in relation to infrastructure next to the road. Next slide, please. So the naturalistic driving studies with traffic conflicts, um, like I say, we we have a lot of data that we are collecting and we're looking at um, the to be proactive rather than reactive. So is it possible for, for us with um, this technology and with these analysis to identify um, um, risk areas where we can intervene before um, uh, a crash, um, for example, takes place? So um, in addition to the naturalistic driving studies, we are currently in the process. We just received the first uh, equipment, which is called Noldus Driver Behavior Observer XT. And it will allow us to do um, very, very fine uh, research that um, investigates driver behavior again in the context of the road and the vehicle and the environment. And then um, next slide, please. We're looking at uh, these delivery motorcycles. Currently, that's a very unregulated space. Um, and we are at the beginning of the research to um, understand uh, the driver behavior, the training, and then we will instrument the, um, some of these motorcycles. And we will then um, look again at the road environments, the infrastructure, and how we can optimize this and regulate this better. Next slide, please. Um, just quickly, innovative road signs. Uh, we are um, participating in committees at the national level where there has been a need to look at innovative material and innovative uh, ways for um, the positioning and uh, the safe um, use of material to um, create safer road environments. Um, and that's a project that's, that is, that's again um, ongoing. And um, it, for example, looks at things like street lights that uh, break away um, technology, which um, is part of that whole idea of a forgiving road environment that you don't have to die when you when you when you leave the road. Next slide, please. Um, then the other thing is um, with the University of Dresden, we've um, engaged in research specifically um, again using the NDS methodology to look at our African infrastructure. And with a PhD student from the Dresden University um, to look at how these automated vehicles in future will function on our roads. And currently the European code book or the European um, uh, manual that um, instructs the um, autonomous vehicles 
does not take into account uh, someone at, standing at the traffic light or the edge breaks uh, next to the road and things like that. So we are engaged with them to look at the future of mobility, vehicle to vehicle and vehicle to infrastructure um, research. The next slide. This is um, a project that I think you're familiar with, um, the Pottle GP, and I know Sunrill also has a Pottle app, um, where the Pottle reporting is done by the public and um, where the infrastructure is um, then fixed by dedicated teams. Um, and yesterday, I think I, I heard on the radio that there's so many potholes, they don't have enough teams to actually go and fix the potholes. Next slide, please. Harry, can you move on to the next slide? Are you still hearing me? Yes, we can. Okay. So this is this is why we're actually in the Eastern Cape, and um, it is our donkey and road safety project where we are bringing together communities, um, animal welfare, and road authorities for the first time to talk to each other to manage this problem. Um, what I want to say with this photo is that technology is not always um, buttons and algorithms. It might be something simple. Um, and this was a suggestion from one of the guys from Sunroll, Danford Adams, who indicated that they are looking at innovative ways to manage um, access of the animals to the road by, for example, planting sour grass. So then the animals don't want to go near the road, but they stay away from the road to, to, to get to the sweet grass. So we don't always need um, to think too far away. However, the other part of the uh, project is to look at um, instrumenting the donkeys to be able to track and trace them um, on a, in, in a better way. But this will obviously depend on, uh, from community to community. Next slide, please. So then um, the Limpopo Road Safety Program, um, there I'm technical lead um, for the safe system approach that's being implemented in the, in the province. Next slide, please. The project um, consists of 13 projects, and these 13 projects are um, clustered around the um, five pillars of the safe system approach, so strategy, data, and so forth for the pillar one, institutional management. It's got a very, very large infrastructure component where the International Road Assessment Program will be conducting IRAP assessments for the Limpopo roads. Um, and they will do that with Roll and um, with the current consultants who are responsible for the road asset management system um, on the road or, or, or in the province. Um, however, there is also the project six, which is an innovation project. And I think that's actually why Ari asked me originally to present in this forum. Um, you can move to the next slide. Because where we normally do road safety assessments and we look at the road environment and the infrastructure um, around uh, the roads, it's a very manual process. And last year, the CSIR published the South African Road Assessment Methods Manual, which is um, looking at road safety investigations, road safety assessments, as well as audits, the old, um, it will, um, replace the SARSHAM 2012 manual. So we're following those methodologies, but it's still very uh, labor intensive. It, um, you have to drive the roads, you have to code the roads with the videos. So we're looking at an innovation project where we can make use of other types of technology to automate some of the processes. Next slide, please. So this work is being done by the Center for Robotics and Future Production at the CSIR, uh, Dr. Stephen Marie. Um, they will be responsible for these work pocket packages. Sickles should not be there. Um, 
this was initially done for the rail environment. However, the intention is to see how we can apply this to the road. Next slide, please. So again, uh, this is for track and infrastructure conditions monitoring to uh, look at cracks and to look at um, the detection of failures in the infrastructure. And again, we'll be looking at how we can um, detect this uh, uh, and, and automate it for uh, doing assessments on the, on the, the, road, in, the, the road network um, using the technologies and also possibly looking at the use of satellite data um, and satellite images to uh, detect failures and um, infrastructure problems uh, on the roads. Next uh, slide, please. So this is the, um, the RIA process, and it's very similar to the portal um, app, although it's a bit more sophisticated, as it also maps the, um, the, the infrastructure defects, it measures it, so it gives you an uh, inventory of um, what needs to be done to actually fix those um, infrastructure. The, um, it's geolocated, um, which is very important so that we know where um, we will need to, um, to do the, the repairs and so on. And important is that with these 30 projects, whether it's um, a project for the road safety com uh, communities or the schools, so we'll also be doing IRAP. Uh, school road assessments around the schools. All of this needs to feed in the data platform and ultimately, eventually, it needs to inform um, a road safety strategy for the province. Next um, slide, please. So again, this is cloud-based. Um, it's accessible. Um, we still need to decide on how to integrate the different uh, data platforms. And um, as I said, it's work in progress. Next slide, please. Again, this is just an example of um, automation of um, defects and how you can start classifying things. And this is not obviously puddles, but the application can also be used to, for example, map and position uh, road infrastructure, missing road infrastructure, looking at uh, where there's culverts um, or safety uh, things, safety concerns, uh, where there's a need for restraint systems and things like that. Next slide, please. Again, the same, um, just another example. And then next slide, please. Um, as I said, looking at the road surface, again, this is um, a potentially an area where we can apply the satellite imagery um, and automate some of these processes also for um, surface uh, assessments and for the detection of objects. Currently, uh, it's looking at static objects, but there's obviously also potential to expand the functionalities to detect um, non-motorized transport users and so on, vulnerable road users. Next slide, please. I don't know if there's any questions. That was quite a mouthful. Um, but thank you. Arina, it might be a me, mouthful, uh, but it's, it's um, very interesting. <laughs> it's very, very interesting, Karin, and uh, very innovative. Thank you very much. It's, it's so exciting. I'm quite sure you and Franz Trubi will also be able to have a very interesting discussion. Um, uh, I look Karin, forward. <laughs> yeah. Karin, can you stay on for, for a few minutes and we we'll take questions and answers? Sure. Thank you. We're just going to, to you know, prepare the room here and then we're going to have a quick panel discussion then. All right, let's get our program up just to see where we are. All right, so at the moment we have uh, Dr. Karin Fenter. She just presented, Senior Researcher, CSR and the Impact Catalyst online. Um, I don't know if the Italians are still online. 
Um, and Louise, I don't know. Okay, you've got lots of connection problems. As you said, the load shedding is making it tougher. Um, let me hear um, the Italian guys, Matteo and Andrea. Are you guys still online? Okay, so it seems to me we've got the two panelists then. We've got uh, Franz Trubig, who's the chief executive officer of Easway Labs. He presented on the Ryobandel proof technology. And we've got uh, Dr. Karin Fenter, who spoke about you know, the innovative technologies for safer road infrastructure. So um, we're going to keep an eye on the chat room and Zoom and the text box in YouTube for you guys posting questions there. And I'm going to now prepare for you guys in this venue to ask questions. And you can ask a question for any one of our panelists. I see there are comments on, on Zoom, but not uh, questions yet. Let me have a look at YouTube quickly. Seems that the people are stunned. No questions here. Is yes and suggestion that Louise must record a presentation and then issue to the Toronto Forum. We will really make a plan to get Luis's presentation as a recording or to have a present at the next event. So let's have a look. Is there anybody here with questions? We've got Dr. Josh. Yeah, thank you, Ari. Uh, my question goes to Karin Venter, the one who's just presented on uh, road safety. Now, what we realize is that many of the road operators, especially if you talk of transport operators and, uh, and even private car operators, is they can do anything to avoid safety measures, especially if the cost the the cost of the safety gadget uh, is going to increase the cost of operations. So in the this particular system that she has presented on, who bears the cost? Is it the manufacturer of the vehicle or the operator? Thank you, Dr. Josh. Karin, you're welcome to respond. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Josh. Um, the Natural Electric Driving Studies um, equipment is um, the tech equipment, or originally it was the tech equipment, and the CSIR is currently funding that. So um, with the Nolders Drive Lab, the Observer XP, it is um, also something... It's it's like a driver simulator. We're also driving. We're also procuring a driver simulator, um, but that's currently the costs are being incurred by um, the CSR or through our parliamentary grant. But obviously, research in future um, will be funded externally. Um, I'm not sure if that answers your questions. In 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 terms of um, the fact that people try to um, not put technology into their vehicles. I think that's where something um, like the voluntary self-regulation scheme, the RTMS um, scheme is so important and needs so much promotion um, so that operators and um, uh, drivers and uh, that everyone takes responsibility for their actions and for um, the, the safety of vehicles, safety of other road users. But I also think that technology is getting cheaper than it was um, a few years ago. And these days, um, for the Limpopo Road Safety Program, we recently bought um, just a normal Garmin drive. Um, and it's actually amazing technology. And it's really, it's not that expensive. And it's, it's off the shelf. So um, in terms of management i think it is possible to um do this and to promote road safety without breaking the bank completely thank you karin yes another question from olga uh morning uh, karin i'm happy that you were speaking about limpopo i'm one of the people who's morning. very passionate am i not uh, 
And I say thank you, Karim. Um, I'm one of the people who's very passionate about the rural areas and more especially about the safety of uh, the uh, children on the streets. Um, because uh, with Limpopo, we have been experiencing quite a high number of uh, uh, fatalities and uh, also injuries um, with regard to the buses uh, where people lose their lives because of uh, some of the roads are not uh, actually up to standard. We know, yes, South Africans, mm. the roads are not up, all up to standard. However, uh, we, we we need to look at the uh, uh, innovative ways of making them uh, 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 smooth for, 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 for the motorist and for the uh, uh, operators. My question to you is uh, the roadshows that have been conducted with regard to safety uh, from the Department of Transport and uh, the impact cap uh, uh, catalyst, how, how, how did you uh, um, ensure that it reached the target uh, market or the people that uh, really need that because um, it looks like uh, uh, the royal houses were not involved as a result. Not many people were uh, uh, actually attending to those road shows. And uh, we really need uh, uh, support from uh, your department CSIR and uh, the impact cat catalyst to, and to make sure that we, we get uh, the safety of our children and uh, the other road users uh, adhered to. So with regard to those roadshows, how do you ensure uh, that it, uh, it, it reaches the market, it reaches the people that need it? And also not only looking at the royal houses, but also the municipalities, because uh, those are the ones that have the direct connection with the people on the ground. Others are the NGOs. You are ignoring the NGOs. For, uh, I'm talking from the uh, CSIR. Uh, not everybody. Uh, from the NGOs were involved in those uh, uh, road safety. Uh, the safety is not only about the transport, but also by the, the, the buses or the cars hitting our children, but also the safety of our children going onto the uh, roads to ask for lift because uh, the, some of the rural areas, because of the regraveling of the roads, children travel plus minus 10 kilometers to access education, which is still not fair for our, our rural people at this age of time, when we are talking in a democratic South Africa. Thank you, Olga. Karin, you can respond. Thank you. I 100% I agree with you. Um, and I think we've been to the Venetia area um, end of January to do road safety assessment there. And the roads, um, that gravel road that you saw there, it's been graded to the ground. And um, it's actually uncomprehensible that there are uh, buses and other vehicles traveling on that road because it's, it's really it's really bad so you're 100 correct and that's communities where children need to get access to school it's people that need to get to the market it's people that um, actually have to go to work and the roads are so inaccessible in terms of the traditional leaders the royal houses as well as the ngos there is a specific component for that uh, which is the community and the schools, the safer road users pillar that is being addressed. And we have not yet had, had road shows. So um, we are currently focusing on um, specific priority projects, and that is project um, free, starting to develop data platforms. Um, project four and five, which look at provincial road infrastructure and the star rating of the roads, working with role and the um, RAMS project that they currently have underway, as well as the um, the schools and the um, community project. And the intention is to have a launch for um, for the program towards May of this year, and then there will be specific um, community engagement in um, the five districts. So I don't think I included my contact details on my presentation. I'm sorry, that was an oversight. Um, but you are welcome. Um, I can maybe just drop it in the chat and then um, you are welcome to contact me and we see how we can work together. They said they can hear us. Okay. <laughs> We're going to continue now with the session. Apologies for this. Um, we had load shedding and yes, they dropped us off the session. So let's continue with the with the panel discussion then.
we still have uh, Mr. Uh, Franz Strube here that presented on the rail uh, system. And uh, I see we've, we've lost the others because obviously we were off too long. But let's continue then. Let's talk to Franz. Franz, I was wondering myself, um, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the research you guys have done and you know the distance that, that solution of yours can really detect uh, tampering on the rail. Maybe you can tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, thanks, Harry. So, I mean, our research has to, to date been very sort of guerrilla like. You know, we've had to, uh, with permission of, of PRASA, you know, go onto the railways uh, and, um, and sort of in small sections do our testing. And early on, we were able to see about three kilometers. So that's center fed, so one and a half kilometers both ways. Um, we can do four kilometers. But we, we also, we believe that, that there's potential for more. So we haven't actually, the, our biggest constraint has been uh, that, that we, we don't have a section of continuously welded rail in Somerset West longer than four kilometers. So, <laughs> so that, that is the next step for us really to, to get access to, um, to longer rails, also different, different types of rails, uh, the, like Sodana Scission line, which is a you know, very high voltage line see how we fare there but um but we're using very little power so if if range is a is a big requirement we can always boost that but there are trade-offs in this game so for now we are focusing on on very little copper uh, so so we're keeping power very low very low copper obviously not uh, potential theft see there's a question at the back there yeah, now we're online. Now that's in the store connected. Well, that's well, that's don't, uh, don't work very fast. Yeah, so we, we currently, um, and I, I cannot disclose the name of this company, but we're talking to a company in Germany and, and in the US, and we're shipping them a few test units. And, and four kilometers is a very long distance for them. So, um, that you know that number really makes that makes their eyes go big. So um, it sounds like a short distance. Like on on the Saldana Session line, it's about six hundred and eighty kilometers. Um, so then, if you have to to put a sensor every four kilometers, you know that sounds sounds like a lot. But in this case, it's not such a big issue because it's a the device is a lot cheaper than than the traditional hardware. No, no copper cabling again. So normally you would have to run trenches to actually lay copper cabling for power and communication to, to these devices. So it's, it's actually overall very easy and cheap to, to install. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Franz. Now we can try the questions there. Say the back and then I'll come to you. Thank you so much. My name is uh, Romeo Lutuli. Uh, my question goes to France. So I'm currently doing research on blockchain technology um, within uh, logistics. So I just want to find out, have you considered um, blockchain technology within your, 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 your devices that you are using? Because I do know that the research that I'm, show, that I'm doing is showing that traceability is one of the most important things in in what we do, so are you, have you have you have you maybe considered uh, maybe incorporating the technology into your space? And then another thing is to everyone in the house. Um, I am currently doing research. If you want to share your email because I'm doing a survey research, please reach out to me because I've got a very low response rate. If you can uh, share your email, I would appreciate that. Thank you. 
Thank you. Let's take this question as well, then you can answer. Uh, good day, uh, friends. Uh, my name is uh, Marvin Kosa, uh, a PhD candidate for transport economics. I'm fortunate my supervisor is here, Dr. Josh, uh, working with uh, Prof. Uh, Rose. Yeah, so uh, first of uh, the first one will be a comment. Uh, it is very interesting what we are doing. I've been in the railway operations for over 15 years now. So I know that the track, uh, the, 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 the track site indicators, they are very expensive, uh, very expensive to maintain and everything. So it is uh, a, well, a, a great system that you have uh, designed, my brother. So, and I hope it goes accordingly and be the pioneer for our railway industry. <clears throat> yeah, my, 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 my second part is that is to ask you uh, uh, your input on regarding the, because I see now uh, all the safety part, you are almost done with it, but when coming to security, especially when it coming to the copper wire, because uh, in the last financial year, Transnet recorded almost 4.1 billion uh, value of copper that was stolen. So I wanted to check with you, what is the immediate uh, uh, thing that can be done in order to, to get rid of this pandemic of cable, uh, I mean, uh, cable theft? Okay, thank you. Thank you. Let me just take this to the front. Thanks, Harry. Yeah, regarding blockchain, I, I appreciate your boldness with that question. I, I have no idea how we can use blockchain, so I haven't considered that. So we'd love to talk to you if you think that, that there's something we may be missing there. Um, then uh, yeah, thank you for the encouraging words on the second uh, the second question. Um, I think cable theft it's a it's a big problem. Uh, that's that's beyond just technology. Obviously, we have um, you know societal issues in South Africa that that run deeper, you know, and have bigger answers. But in terms of uh, of the small things that we can do in technology, you know, I think giving uh, the operator at least insight into what is happening on the rail in real time is critically important. So if, if you don't know that someone is busy grinding away at the rail, uh, you, you, you cannot enforce or stop that from happening. You know? So currently, and, and I think that's what happened with COVID, when trains weren't running, people had time to just sit on the railway lines and, and make mayhem. Yeah. Um, so I think the first thing for copper theft is to have technology and sensing on the rails that provide an early warning system. So the moment you, you get tapping on a railway with a hammer or with you know, any unusual kind of uh, um, anything un unusual happening, you should be notified. And I was just um, uh, talking to Josh about you know, how, how we also, we also um, monitor some other things on the rail, like, like voltages and um, you know, the moment that that a, that a breaker is tripped or someone disables a breaker, you know, to be able to steal overhead cables, you know, there, there, there are ways to, uh, to to provide early warning there. So yeah, I'm I'm a technologist. I don't have the social answers, but uh, no, there's a lot we can do. Right, there's a question, and there and there, they start from the bottom here. Thank you. Uh, my name is Lindy. Okay. Um, I think I bet from all the presenters, um, I remember Dr. George earlier on was talking about lack of integration between the, the, the different models. And it's making me, it's reminding me about the very horrible situation we saw in Volkswagen. When I drive from here, going to KZN, we pass through three provinces. I'm worried in Pumalang, I've seen so many bridges that are set. And on top is the rail. And what's the integration? Then it brought me today to think all these very progressive technologies, satellites that you call them, can't they detect the current problem that we have? Because if we're not detecting and doing something, we're still going to see more. That's the first one. The second one, which I come from the social psychological side now in transport, 
the human behavior. Uh, right now on the ground, people are anti-technology and, and, and robots and, and stuff because some of the transport like rail is, take, is taken as the employment driver and people feel and they are against this that it's going to take their work. What is happening in terms of the cost of skilling people is not only skilling for the human based services, but also changing the mindset and the attitude. Because if we don't do that at the same time as developing technology, we are going to have now pirates versus chiefs game. The derby is the human versus technology. Uh, that that these are my concerns, and I'm throwing them to the presenters. Thank you. Thank you. Very important comment. Ron's going to take the next one. Thank you. My name is Sipo from Sipituba Transport. She's taken some of the questions, but as a follow-up addition, that your technology or your solutions. Can they be extended to the pro problems that we are facing on a daily basis? That is the um, cable theft of ESCOM that affects all of us. Thank you. And let's take the last one here at the back. Hi, Mr. Franz. My name is Naledi. Um, I wanted to ask, do you have like... Um, uh, programs that will help uh, graduates, uh, young graduates, like internship or learnerships. So, and uh, if you have, how can we get them? Thank you for that question. Can we conclude with this? You guys, have it. There is one at the front. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, friends. You, you know, it's, it's so exciting. I am from uh, the Tibet sector where we have introduced uh, transport and logistics. We have fried as one of uh, the, the, the subjects. And um, exposure to this type of forums, it uh, excites us because we'll go back to class and be relevant than to be sticking to textbook that does not know what is going on out there. And it was just a comment, not uh, a question. And would like to be called, I should think it's our care, college who's uh, uh, attending this uh, uh, forum today. And maybe going forward, we, we need to be as a sector for education to be invited to, to this, even uh, the high rank uh, uh, officials of uh, Department of Education need to be knowing about this because as being in class, we need to be relevant too. Thank you for that comment. Yeah, we can give them a hand. <laughs> no, thank you for all the comments and questions. Very encouraging. Um, so around the, the, the sagging bridges, that's actually a good question for Karin, I think. And um, not, that, not that I'm punting Garmin, but Garmin actually has a product that they use in the US that they put on, on the RVs, which it's a little uh, radar sensor that uh, detects exactly that. So to instrument some, uh, you know, some cars for the CSIR would make a lot of sense to just measure those, uh, those sagging bridges. Um, the robot threat. So Victor also mentioned that to me, you know, that was his concern. And, and um, I mean, this is something I've encountered a lot in my career, was telling him we did work for Qantas Airlines, developing a system that automates back checking. And the experience there was that the people that used to take the bags weren't being laid off, but they were given an opportunity to assist elderly passengers. They were given a a, a, a better sort of job description in a sense, but there will be jobs lost, um, but there will also be jobs created. And, and so we need someone to paint that bigger picture because it's like, you know, if you, there's that, that story about you, you, you put a bottle in the ground and put some marbles in it, you know, and if a monkey comes and he takes it, doesn't want to leave it, you know, you can catch him. 
and so so we need to you know let something go you know to to get the the bigger picture and to to get the bigger rewards but i think that takes leadership on a high level to to take people along there um because yeah, you cannot you cannot keep having people at an automated ticket booth accepting tickets and putting it in that's also not that's not a real you know really creating any value um yeah iscom's cable theft i i don't have a real insight into that and i don't think it's a technology problem so I mean, they've got very smart engineers and i'm sure they can detect that i think it's um it's more more of a systemic thing i yeah i don't know um but i think there's a lot of probably effort going into solving that uh, particular problem uh, in terms of internships we are that's a great question we are we're definitely looking for for interns we're looking for um, good young engineers so if you know of anybody that that's interested in in kind of product development and um that's that's really bright you know, please let them send their cvs i think um my email address will be available through harry um that is a, yeah we're very keen on that um and that is the other part of the robot story <laughs> so you know we want to set up a manufacturing facility we want to employ people um and so it's being funded by the technology innovation agency also you know it's a, it gives us a mandate to do that um yeah that, i think that's it thank you for your comment about being relevant and inspiring the next generation thank you yes indeed let's give our panelists panelists a big hand france thank you very much for entertaining us today and for showing us a good product and we really believe that that's going to be a bright future for this product and going to help us for maintaining our rail infrastructure in south africa and many 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 more thank you so much ladies and gents okay um we're saying goodbye now to our online people and uh thank you for joining in we really appreciate the long the online people um and uh we hope to see you at the next transport forum event again so thank you very much.